this uh, kind of brings me to the first study that I'm going to share also related to kind of cognitive fatigue was on uh, high dose creatine supplementation following sleep deprivation. So the uh, study title was single dose creatine improves cognitive performance and induces changes in cerebral high energy phosphates during sleep deprivation. This was also, uh, this was a double blind randomized controlled trial. So uh, both the, the participant didn't know whether they were given the creatine or the placebo and neither were the people that were doing the brain scans to, to look at creatine content and also the cognitive testing that occurred. It was an inpatient study. So uh, there was 15 subjects, eight of them were female, seven were male. They were brought into this um, kind of hospital inpatient setting, average age 23 years. And at baseline before being given creatine or the placebo, they had brain scans and cognitive tests to get a kind of baseline before being kept awake all night. So they kind of locked them in and made sure that they didn't get a minute of sleep. After the baseline testing, they were given either, and this is this is an important point, 0.35 grams per kilogram of creatine monohydrate, which for you or I works out to be like 30 to 35 grams. Yeah. Or 0.35 grams per kilogram of a placebo, which I believe, I think it was dextrose. Uh, it might have been maltodextrin. Before being kept awake all night and undergoing brain scans and completing cognitive tests at two-hour intervals. So they started the cognitive tests, I think, at 11.30, and then they kept doing them every two hours until like 5.30 a.m. So this this is certainly a high dose of creatine. Um, you know, the dose generally for hypertrophy, strength, body composition in the literature is like three to five grams per day or uh, something that is a little uh, more individualized for your body size is 0.1 grams per kilogram in the literature. So if you're 80 kilograms, it's eight grams a day, 50 kilograms, five grams a day. Um, whereas in this study, like I said, that 0.35 grams per kilogram for you or I is like 30 to 35 grams in a single dose. And the so the rationale for that, which I think is really cool, is that when we ingest creatine, the first place it goes is to muscle cells. And it's not until those muscle cells are fully saturated that there is excess creatine, which can go typically to cardiac, so to heart tissue, to bone, and some can get across the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. Um, so you require a dose above that you know, five or eight grams of creatine that is required to saturate your muscles, depending on how much muscle tissue you have, to actually have enough creatine available to get into the brain. They found a, a, a few very interesting things. The first was that the oral creatine monohydrate was bioavailable, very bioavailable to the brain at this dose. So this, this, this single dose significantly raised brain creatine levels. And that's consistent with other studies that have been looking at this. The second thing that, that I think was interesting was that they also, they asked subjects about like how fatigued they felt. So they were looking at subjective fatigue. And when subjects were given the creatine, they had significantly less subjective fatigue. They didn't feel as tired. And the third thing was, to do with the cognitive testing. So when the, when subjects were given the creatine supplementation, they had significantly better short-term memory and reaction speed. And the maximum effect of that creatine dose was seen at four hours. So four hours after having that high dose was when they got the, the kind of biggest uh, bang for their buck. And then it started to taper off, but it lasted up to nine hours post-ingestion. Yeah. And remember, this is a crossover trial, so every subject does both. So it's, a, it's a, quite a high quality. It is only 15 subjects, uh, but it's very controlled. I was surprised uh, 
that at that high dose of creatine because i'm not sure what your experience is like with creatine but if i if i have even 10 grams in a single dose on an empty stomach i will quite often get like some gastrointestinal like it's kind of distress and feel a little nauseous i don't know if you've ever experienced that but it's a common it is a common kind of uh adverse effect of, of creatine but in this study this high dose there was no reports of gastrointestinal symptoms or nausea or anything very interesting. Yeah, I personally don't feel the distress uh, like you do, but I don't have an empty stomach with water. I, I actually add it to my smoothie post-workout. And I mean, the rationale for that was it's based on kind of old studies, but it's just a convenient way so that I don't forget to take it, but also that it's paired with carbohydrates and protein and potentially may shuttle those nutrients into muscle cells a little bit quicker and easier than if you take it on an empty stomach, especially. And again, this is massive speculation, but I always think because I have diabetes and I only, I don't, I don't produce insulin. So the only time that I have insulin working as a key to unlock the, the gateways to my cells is when I eat meals. So if I take creatine outside of mealtime and I don't, I don't know if insulin is a shuttle for creatine, but I do know that studies have looked at whether you have it with carbohydrates and the, the theory is that carbohydrates, you know, um, cause insulin to be released by the pancreas and that can help get nutrients into cells so i just tend to have it with meals um i don't know if having it on an empty stomach would cause more distress i'm assuming this this group of people had it just with straight water this episode is proudly brought to you by 38 terra try 38 terra's dmn prebiotic the science-based daily multivitamin for your gut microbes a simple and delicious way to take your gut health to the next level now back in stock in new and improved packaging for customers living in the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Get 10% off your DMN at 38terra.com using the code THEPROOF. That's 38TERA.com and use the coupon code THEPROOF for 10% off. Yeah, I, I believe they did. When I have it with food, I don't get those GI symptoms. But typically, if I was to have a high dose like that, I would personally, and this would be going away from the study protocol, so it may not work as well, but I would probably split that dose up. Um, but uh, I just recorded a solo episode on creatine, actually, and um, I did come across some research suggesting, and that this was brought up around endurance athletes, actually, and high-intensity athletes that do high-intensity work, uh, that creatine in combination with carbohydrates there's some evidence that it can can result in quicker replenishment of glycogen and also help increase the amount of glycogen that you can actually store which could be beneficial for 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 particularly for an endurance athlete that has like um sort of periods where they're doing high intensity surges right right and also i guess the question is if you are taking creatine for the strength and hypertrophy benefits and you're working out once every 24 hours, there's no urgency to replenish those stores. You've got 24 hours to replenish before you go to the gym the next day. But in this study, it seems like they're looking at that high dose in one big hit because they're trying to essentially like kind of flood the brain with more creatine. Whilst if you drip feed that over 24 hours, you're not going to see the effect straight away. So yeah, I mean, it's an interesting design. The other really, I think, critical thing to point out here is that there's there's a lot of people online talking about taking creatine high dose for cognition right but there is actually very little evidence that creatine improves cognition in a healthy person who doesn't have a stressed brain and and so like i think it's very important to underscore that this is in sleep a state of sleep de deprivation it, it, this is a huge acute stressor on the brain right and there is there is quite a bit of evidence suggesting that um, in, like a, in a healthy brain, neurons or astrocytes produce creatine and they produce all the creatine that the brain needs. So it's probably only in a stress brain, whether it's acute from something like sleep deprivation or there are researchers suggesting that maybe even that following like a concussion or a traumatic brain injury or chronic conditions like depression, uh, or Alzheimer's potentially, there are researchers looking at that, where the brain is under chronic stress that 
in those in those kind of contexts, this high dose creatine supplementation will result in creatine crossing the blood brain barrier. But ordinarily, your your astrocytes, these cells in your brain, are producing all the creatine that your brain requires. And there's a very interesting piece of evidence that speaks to this, where they took omnivores and vegetarians and looked at creatine levels in their brain, because you might assume that uh, omnivores have higher levels of of brain creatine right because they do have higher levels of muscle creatine right because they're consuming some degree of creatine in their food whilst vegetarians are probably not right but in actual fact and i'll put this into the show notes the brain creatine levels of omnivores and vegetarians are not different Wow. Okay. and that is probably because coming back to what i said earlier the first five to ten grams of creatine in your diet where does that go it goes to muscle tissue and you're not getting more than five or 10 grams per day of creatine in a, in an omnivorous diet. In fact, just to get five grams of creatine a day, I put this into the episode. You have to consume an obscene amount of, of red meat and fish and chicken that no one, no one in their right mind would get to except for Paul Saladino. But even he, even Paul Saladino supplements with creatine monohydrate. Right. Yeah. Um, which I included in that episode. But I guess take home point here being that if you have a night where you're getting, you know, very minimal or no sleep, then you could use a high dose creatine monohydrate at 0.35 grams per kilogram to improve your cognition in that next day if you have uh, you know, some type of important um, meeting or podcast or something that's going to be cognitively demanding. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if, like, obviously, it can be an acute therapeutic dose, like as like a sort of a one-off, as you just mentioned. But I wonder if that same dose taken chronically, if the baseline conditions are somebody who's very stressed and who is dealing with a lot of mental stress and other things, if that would have a therapeutic benefit going forward. But obviously, we can't extrapolate from this study because it was probably just one night of sleep deprivation. But I wonder if, like, there are people who would actually benefit from higher doses more frequently, maybe not 0.35, you know, but, you know, in, in the sports science literature, a high, the highest dose that's sort of recommended is 20 grams a day split across five uh, different intakes. I wonder if even that would have some therapeutic benefit. Right. And that's, that's typically like the loading phase, the loading phase, correct. The loading phase. And then, you know, generally in those study protocols, they'll move to a maintenance phase of back to that five grams a day or 0.1 grams per per kilogram but yeah i think it's i think it's interesting i think this is a watch this space there'll be a lot more research on creatine and how it affects cognition within those different contexts like tbi or post-concussion or uh, in patients with alzheimer's depression etc and so you know over the next few years there'll be more studies published and we can come back to it so is the idea that 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 night of sleep deprivation impacts the brain's ability to create its own creatine and synthesize it from those neurons that you were mentioning to the point where the supplementation is pretty much the fast track to like replenish brain stores like what is the mechanism behind the depletion of brain creatine from a sleepless night that's a good question i'm not sure whether it's that there is a depletion or the the brain requires more creatine has kind of increased energy requirements after sleep to kind of make up for all the things that didn't occur. And with the increased energy requirement, if you can kind of push a super physiological level of creatine in the brain, you can theoretically what creatine is helping you do is uh, generate more, synthesize more ATP, right? So it allows like from a muscle point of view, it allows you to do more work. And from this perspective, it's like allowing your brain to do more work in a context where there is increased energy requirements within the brain maybe to repair you know, processes that didn't occur because you were up all night. Um, I don't know that that mechanism is fully understood. Yeah, it's early days, but that's really interesting. Sounds good. I, that's something that I've never played around with, my dose. I just take five to six grams every day. I've never even, you know, I was reading a study when I was looking for some papers for today um, talking about creatine recommendations and how the guidelines based on this absolute gram based you know like five grams per day is not really suited for the individual it should be based on a percentage of their body weight or lean mass even even better if you can 
Um, so I think that's something that I, I might even play around with myself is up my dose a little bit. Yeah, I shifted from five grams a day to 0.1 grams per day a little while ago. I was actually following a conversation with uh, Dr. Darren Kandau, who's one of the kind of main creatine researchers out there. And for that reason, that you know, five grams is rather arbitrary. It's, it's, it's not individualized to your body composition at all. Um, 0.1 grams for me works out to be like, you know, 8, 8.7, 8.7 to 9 grams, right? Something like that. But I just round up to two scoops and it's 10 grams a day. Yeah. yeah. I might give that a crack. Did you notice any difference? Did you feel anything? Or, or was it I didn't notice any difference from a performance point of view. The research suggests like that you might get some, some, some benefits to bone, like bone geometry. There's some some studies, but that was in postmenopausal women. It wasn't in in men. Um, what does that actually mean in terms of like bone strength and risk of falls later in life? We don't really know. So, uh, I think the the most solid evidence is clearly for building strength, uh, hypertrophy, body composition. There is, and then there's this new evidence for high dose kind of following sleep deprivation, but that's also a single study. So I'm sharing it, but I'd love to see that replicated, more people, people different ages. Um, but also worth noting that they use creatine monohydrate like pretty much every single study. So you may come across all these other forms of creatine out there and often that's just a brand trying to find a unique selling point and a way to kind of sell their creatine for a higher price. And make more margin. There's no there's no evidence to suggest that there's another form of creatine that's better absorbed that results in better strength, hypertrophy, etc. So you can you can stick with um, creatine monohydrate and save your money. Yeah, awesome, love it. It's 2025, and I have made the decision to join Function Health to help monitor and optimize my health. And honestly, after getting set up, I am wondering. What took me so long? Function makes it extremely easy to track important biometric information over a lifetime. Information that you can use in real time to make important health decisions. Function gives you over 100 lab tests covering your entire body every year. Heart, hormones, liver, kidneys, thyroid, metabolic health, heavy metals, autoimmunity, nutrients, and more. Five times more testing than your typical physical for $499 a year. A lot cheaper than if you were to order all of these tests individually. That's if you can order them. Take ApoB and LP little a, for example, two very important tests for determining your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. Yet, as outlined in multiple episodes on this show by Dr. Thomas Dayspring, they can be incredibly difficult to order with your local doctor. Using Function is very straightforward. You join and then visit one of their 2000 US lab locations. I went to one here in LA where I live. It's very easy. And and boom, your results are tracked over time in one secure place. No shady upselling, no gimmicks, just your results beautifully presented and science-based insights from doctors to help you optimize your health. Skip the 400,000 person wait list today at functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill and join me on the path to nerd level health optimization. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.